lifting up Jesus, opening his word from Australia, Denmark, Israel, Japan, New Zealand, Northern Ireland, Republic of Ireland, Singapore, South Africa, United Kingdom, Thailand, the Philippines, United States, and throughout the world. You're watching L'Oreal TV. Hi, this is Tim with Morial TV and Morial Radio, here live via Skype in England with James Jacob Prash. Uh, Jacob, there was a recent meeting between Israeli pastors and a messianic version of the NAR. Um, and for uh, believers that may not know what the NAR is, could you please explain that and explain the controversy that surrounds this meeting? First of all, let's begin with the NAR. The forerunner of the NAR, in its present manifestation at least, was the Restoration Movement that came out of England, who had origins with people who had these Restorationist churches, such as Ictus with Roger Foster, who was an Annihilationist and a Replacementist, General Coates, who was Replacementist, um, Terry Virgo, various other such people who were influenced by the late Arthur Wallace, and they would claim Austin Sparks, although their claims to the doctrinal succession of the beliefs of Austin Sparks are dubious by the accounts of many people. It's not clear that Austin Sparks believed all of what they propounded. These are the Restorationists. They're still around. The Restorationists were committed to restoring three things that never existed. The first was their version of apostolic authority. There is no apostolic authority other than the writing of the apostles. That is apostolic authority in the sense of the apostles who actually saw the Lord, of Peter, James, John, Paul, people of that nature. They don't exist anymore. Of the various categories of apostles found in the New Testament, the only category that still exists are church-planting missionaries. That would be the word, apostle, the one who was sent out. In Scripture, however, the Holy Spirit dictated that these men were sent out in pairs. What's being called apostolic authority today is a one-man show. It is what's known theologically as monoepiscopacy taken to a natural conclusion as an extreme. In other words, it's a formula for heavy shepherding, that you have an apostle over your region or over your area, and you've got to go under that apostle to be in, in the move and presence of God. The second thing that the Restoration Movement tried to restore that was not biblical was their version of prophetic authority. Now, they base these things, of course, on Ephesians 4, apostles, prophets, pastors, evangelists, teachers. But they misinterpreted that passage. And their version of prophetic authority they jumped in bed with the Kansas City Falls Prophets, imported into England with the help of the late John Wimber of the Vineyard Movement and Mike Bickle of IHOP. And all of the charismania and extreme manifestations that went with it. These people were among the first to embrace the counterfeit revivals out of Toronto and so forth. But what we saw was they made prophecies that didn't happen. Mike Bickle did that. Uh, in uh, August of 1990, how a revival was going to come to Great Britain and spread out across Germany. Well, since 1990, more mosques have been built in England than churches. Mike Bickle is a proven false prophet based on Deuteronomy 18 and so forth. He's a proven false prophet. This was Mike Bickle, who brought in the Kansas City false prophets, such as the alcoholic, homosexual Paul Kane, the womanizer Bob Jones, who's now deceased, these people who predicted crazy things that never happened. So their version of apostolic authority is you can predict things in the name of the Lord that don't happen and still be an apostle or still be a prophet. The third thing they tried to 
restore that ever existed, and you can't restore that which never existed to begin with, but they think you can, is dominion theology, kingdom now theology. To do this, they took charismania, extreme charismatic manifestations, counterfeits of gifts of the spirit, false prophecy, things of this nature, and emotionally charged mysticism, which they imagined to be spiritual. And they merged that, first of all, with ecumenism. They reached out ecumenically to the Church of Rome and so forth. But they merged that charismatic extremism to the reconstructionism of hyper-Calvinists, oddly, who were cessationists, strange bedfellows. You had people like Rausus Rashtuni, Gary North, David Chilton, this idea that the church is going to conquer the world for Christ before he comes, take over the institutions of government, culture, economy, etc., establish his kingdom on earth, and then he would come. It wouldn't be that Jesus is coming with a triumphant church that's been raptured and resurrected, but he's coming for one that has already conquered the world in his name, they say, or they believed. This was the restoration movement. It tried to restore three things that never existed. But interestingly, it was replacement theology. It believed that this triumphant church replaced Israel to the negation of God's prophetic purpose for the Jews. Again, they found a friend in Mike Bickle, but Mike Bickle is not really replacement theology. He's rather a friend of extreme elements of the messianic movement. So we bring in another dimension. But first of all, let's understand the New Apostolic Reformation. The New Apostolic Reformation is essentially the American branch of Restorationism, although not necessarily replacement theology. It comes from the influences of the late C. Peter Wagner, the ecumenical guru. It comes from, again, people who prophesy things falsely like Cindy Jacobs, who falsely predicted in the name of the Lord that Zimbabwe was going to be the garden spot of Africa, when in fact the diametric opposite happened and Robert Mugabe destroyed it. You have this apostle, and you have this prophet, and they're over this place, and it has the dominionist influence and the ecumenical influence and the extreme charismatic influence. That, taken to its natural conclusions, results in the things you see with Bethel with people like Bill Johnson, where you have open mysticism and open Gnosticism pretending to be New Testament spirituality, pretending to be Christianity, this open spiritual counterfeit. And of course, these are natural bedfellows with things like Hillsong, Carl Linz, and the Houstons, and so forth. That's what it is. Another partner would be Steve Furtick, Again, a natural bedfellow for this kind of thinking. But it all comes back to the idea of trying to restore things that scripturally and historically never existed. Enter the messianic wing of it, if you can believe it. We've warned many times that there are multiple strains, strings within the messianic movement. There are good ones. Theologically, go back to the time of Alfred Edersheim, David Barron. You've got Messianic scholars who are credible. E. E. Ellis, Dr. Arnold Fruchtenbaum. You have <coughs> um, Dr. Michael Rydelnik at Moody. Credible people who understand correctly the relationship between first century Judaism, that is second temple period Judaism, and the rise of Christianity and the Judeo-Christian roots of the church, and the need to understand the scriptures, particularly the Gospels in that light. This is all valid. And again, based on 1 Corinthians 9, Jewish believers and their families, on a voluntary, voluntary basis, remaining observant for devotional reasons, for cultural reasons, and as a testimony to the Jewish community, as, and as an evangelistic strategy. No problem. 
But then you have the extreme element. Those who want to live under two covenants in the fashion of the Seventh-day Adventists, putting people in bondage to the law, putting Gentiles in bondage to the law, practicing Yiddishkeit, Ashkenazi diasporic Jewish culture, pretending it's biblical Jewish culture, imitating the rabbis who reject their own Messiah, the lunatic fringe of the Messianic movement. A kingpin of this is Dan Justin. Theologically and doctrinally, an extremely ignorant man. Again, prone to hyper-charismatic extremism. I felt tremendous compassion for him when tragedy struck his family. It was very ugly. It was terrible. His son was asphyxiated in a fire with another youth. It was absolutely terrible. But he had false prophets, crazy people, lunatics, apparently, calling him up on his cell phone, telling him not to take his son's brain-dead remains off of artificial life support. God was going to raise his son from the dead. And he believed these people. Now, a father who's lost a son who's in despair would want to believe it. If somebody's giving him a glimmer of hope, I didn't blame Dan Justice for believing that. But why was he associated with crazy people like that to begin with? Why did he lend them any credence to begin with? He went with the promise keepers thing, most of which was unscriptural. He's a man who's very, very ignorant of the word of God doctrinally. Apparently, in league with him, or if not subordinate to him, is someone called Asher Intrader and one or two others. They had taken these new apostolic reformation, cum restorationist ideas, wedded these ideas with uh, messianic extremism, or hyper-messianic extremism, bearing in mind my family of Israeli Jews, my wife's the daughter of Holocaust survivors, my son was in the IDF, I was for a short time, my family are observant. But again, on a voluntary basis, for reasons of testimony, culture, witness, and so on, not in such a matter as to put others in bondage to the law. Well, they come with their agenda. I watched a film clip of them a few months ago, and they were delusional in their doctrine. They were thinking that they were they going to be or were called to restore Acts 15, where the apostles and elders would gather in Jerusalem and issue decrees. And that's what we need to get back to. That's what we need to restore. Acts 15 is a quintessential example of the Greek words luo and deo, the Hebrew hetir and esor, or binding and loosing. Jesus gave the apostles authority when acting under the direct inspiration as apostles of the Holy Spirit to define New Testament doctrine. What would be a sword forbidden that you're bound to keep and what would be hit here? The four things were keeping from idolatry, immorality, the ritual consumption of blood, which obviously had idolatrous connotations, as did strangulation. Keep away from those things. But Gentiles can eat shrimp. Gentiles can worship on a Sunday. Jewish believers are free from the curse of the law. <clears throat> Paul said, I became as a Jew, though not being under the law, but under the law of Christ. This lunatic fringe of the Messianic movement who wedded messianic extremism to NAR, hyper-charismatic, reconstructionist, dominionist nonsense with ecumenism attached to it, believed that they need to bring not just Jewish believers, and not just the body of Yeshua, of Messiah and Israel, but somehow the church, 
back to an Acts 15 type situation from what they were saying. Certainly something that would be authoritative in Israel and something that would have a mandate because it came from Jerusalem to send out to the church globally and certainly to the Messianic movement. This is crazy. These people are not apostles. They didn't see Jesus. They had no mandate to define New Testament doctrine. The New Testament is a complete canon. The Holy Spirit told the apostles what to do in terms of doctrinal definition. That authority exists only in the writings of the apostles. There are no more apostles like Peter, Paul, James, John, or Acts 15. That authority rests in what they wrote under the inspiration of the Spirit. But these ignorant crackpots, driven by some kind of a religious pride, propagate this nonsense. When confronted, they apparently tried to deny it and say, that's not what we meant. But enough Israeli pastors, familiar with what they were doing and writing and saying, confronted them with the documented evidence. Their agenda didn't go over too well, thankfully. Let me say this. Dan Juster is an ignorant, ignorant man who should be ignored as any kind of a leader. Asher and Trader, the same. The extreme lunatic fringe of the messianic movement is crazy. They're like Seventh-day Adventists trying to live under two covenants. You want messianic theology? So do I. Read Alfred Edersheim. Read Arnold Fruchtenbaum. Read Dr. Michael Rydelnik. Read E.E. E. Ellis. Read somebody worth reading. Go back to the patriarchs of this. Go back to David Barron. But don't pay attention to these charlatans. Religious charlatans is what they are, and it's all they are. The new apostolic reformation is wrong. And this agenda of the Jerusalem apostles sending out decrees is doubly wrong. It's absurd. It has no scriptural foundation whatsoever. Yes, Dan Juster, I will debate you in front of a camera. We can debate in Hebrew. Or I'll debate you in Hebrew. Whatever you want. I'll do it in the States. I'll do it in Britain. I'll do it in Israel. Let's debate. I say you are a fraud and a charlatan. At best, you're an ignorant religious kook. Nobody should pander to you. Nobody. What you do is just not scriptural. For the first time since the early centuries of belief in Yeshua and Jesus, of the church, God is again moving significantly among the Jewish people. Satan is trying to get in and thwart what God is doing. Just as Paul warned, in his farewell address to the Ephesians. Men will arise from your own selves to draw disciples after them, teaching things that are not scriptural. You are one of those men whom Paul warned against. For your own sake, for your own sake, I hope you will repent and abandon your folly. You don't know what you're doing. At best, you don't know what you're doing. I hope for your sake you don't know what you're doing, because if you do, that would make you an out-and-out -out villain, a collaborator with the devil. Please, don't pay attention to these people. They do not represent the body of Christ in Israel. They do not represent the majority of the Messianic fellowships in Israel. They do not represent anybody but their own agenda and those who were so ignorant and foolish as to follow them and pay attention to them. Thankfully, most of the pastors whom we know in Israel 
from most of the congregations see through that nonsense for what it is and have firmly rejected it. May they continue to do so. Come on, Mr. Juster, I'll debate you. I know what you say. I can document what you say. I can prove it. You want to debate? Let's debate and let the body of Messiah decide for itself. My name is Jacob Prash. God bless and thank you. Thank you, Jacob. <laughs> Jacob. <laughs>